Welcome everyone. Today finds us in Duluth, Minnesota, right on the shores of Lake Superior, where we're going to take a tour through Glensheen Manor. It's called Glensheen because it's built in a glen and the sheen of Lake Superior. Glensheen was built by the Congdon family who made their money in iron mines. Construction started in 1905 and was completed in 1908. Let's go inside and look around. Wow, this is quite an entrance for a mansion. Obviously, these are the stables. This was a fancy place. I have never seen stables so elegant in my entire life. Wow. Looks like this is gonna be a pretty interesting tour beautiful grounds and look at how that mansion overlooks Lake Superior. Wow, there is so much to this. That building right over there where we started is the stable, fanciest stable I've ever seen in my life. And that is the gardener's cottage. That is quite a cottage. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's an entire mansion to see. So this is a reception area. Very elegant. Obviously the furniture is faded, but this is original. And the curtains are encased in plexiglass. This is a smoking room back in the day when they used to have smoking rooms. Look at this old hundred year old intercom system. You can still read where it goes to. People's names, kitchen, different areas. And it does ask that we don't touch anything. I love that door. I suppose that goes outside into that waiting area. I'll walk back around and take a look. Very elegant. I was wrong. This must be a closet or something. Look at that. There's a doorbell next to it. That must go to an interior room. I just realized it's not a doorbell, that's a push button to call a servant. This is so opulent. Obviously we're in the library now. And the original blueprints. This is the third floor. We'll be getting up there later. And this indicates a billiard room and a winter garden and an amusement room. So we'll see all those as we go through the tour. What a beautiful sitting room here in the library. Overlooks Lake Superior. Yes, these are clearly push button lights. Beautiful library.
And I believe that is Chester and Clara and how they looked about the time they lived in the house. So when Clara was in college, she painted that. Look at the old thermostat. That is really neat. All it says is cooler and warmer with a thermometer above it. What a beautiful bedroom. Oh. <laughs> and look at that. They had central vac back then. Pretty fascinating. And here's the other side of that cluster of windows. And that goes right into Marjorie's bedroom. The closet area. And this obviously is a master bedroom. Very large room. Once again, that window overlooks the lake. Awesome fireplace. And this comes right off the master bedroom. We can't go out there. But it's a pretty nice deck, I suppose you'd call it. And this is a dressing area. Wow, look at that fancy shower. It has a main shower head and then one, two, three, four shower heads. Five, six, seven, eight shower heads coming from all directions and the large one up above. I have never seen a shower with eight shower heads, let alone in 1905. And I'm really not sure about this little tiny tub. I don't even know what that's all about. But here's a regular size tub. And it says this was Chester's bedroom. Look at that bowler hat. His clothes are all laid out. For a night on the town, obviously, he's got a top hat there. And this looks out on the back of the house. And I notice that every single room has a fireplace. And here's his closet. And a lot of hats. Now, this is not a particularly large bedroom, I have to admit. And it looks like it's a shared bath with the master. This looks more like an average size bedroom that we might see today. This is a female guest room. It has two beds. This is quite a large room as well. Treated their guests very well. And it says that that painting represents their home in Arizona. So apparently this is what it looked like when they lived here, which is very similar to how we see it today. Once again, we have a shared bathroom. And this is Elizabeth's room, a bit of a smaller room here. And you can see that dresser is still here. And that is hand painted. They yeah, ask so you don't touch it, but it's hand painted. That's a very interesting book table. And if you look at that rocker and that chair by the desk, 
all of that is still here. And this is Helen's room. Wow, what a fancy room. And you can see the bathroom over there. Can't get in there. Fancy fireplace surrounded by pink. A little bit of restoration taking place. And this is a beautiful corner room with another magnificent view of the gardens down below and Lake Superior. So one of the things that was pointed out to me is this double lock on the servants' quarters. One of the guides here told me that the servants' quarters is completely private, locked off from the family. They have a double lock, so the family cannot access it if they wanted to. And they said a family member who used to live here came for this tour, I suppose they were VIPs, and specifically asked to see the servants' quarters because when they lived here, they never saw it. Family members never enter this part of the house. And I'm guessing these are all servants since they're pictured in this part of the building and they all look very happy, don't they? And it looks like this is the linen closet. Interesting how it's all numbered like that. So they remember where the linens go, I would imagine. And every one of those drawers is labeled by room So the servants' quarters are rather plain, but they're very nice, very adequate. There's not a view of Lake Superior, but nice view of the woods. And notice by the way that the servants' quarters are cut off right there where the hallway ends and it turns into the hardwood floor and that begins the servants' quarters. And they do have the intercom here, it's got the bell, it's like a phone talk into there, pick that up, and you can communicate with the various rooms just like we saw downstairs. We're not allowed in these doors, but I imagine they are more bedrooms. And it looks like the servants all shared a common bathroom, just like a family would. And they do get a little view of Lake Superior from the bathroom. And look at this. It's an old elevator. Isn't that cool? There's a button to call the elevator. Before I go downstairs, I gotta see if I can go upstairs because I bought the full tour. This is a cedar closet. I'm trying to get a whiff of the cedar. Maybe if I went deeper inside the closet, there's good circulation here. So this is the infirmary where they would come when they were sick. Oh, and here's another one of those fancy showers. So this is obviously a dark room. So someone had photography as a hobby. And we continue on. These are interesting rooms as well. Wow. Okay, this must be the photographer, Edward. Edward went to Yale and obviously had a hobby of photography. And this is really neat. Look at that view. But I don't know how you get out there. I'm sure that Edward probably crawled out the window, but wouldn't you think they would have a doorway to that balcony? And there's what the room looked like in 1910. Most of the same furniture is still here. Once again, a fireplace. And it looks like little hidden area in there. 
Oh, it's a gun cabinet. Wow. That's why it's hidden. And passing right through into a lounge area. And it says this is the boys' lounge. Looks very manly. They got books, a telescope, some kind of a animal there that maybe one of them took down, I don't know. Another one over there. Think how many thousands of dollars that door alone would cost. So fancy. And the guests as well. Got a magnificent view of Lake Superior. You can actually pretty much see the lake from this window as well. And this it says is Robert's room. Robert was only 10 years old when they moved in. Probably the reason that he got a smaller room in the back rather than facing the lake. Not a bad room though. Pretty fancy. And little Robert grew up to be an attorney, passed the Minnesota bar, and worked in the Congdon office building. And I think perhaps Clara or Elizabeth may have painted these birds all around Robert's room. And look at this, they have a luggage room. Look at all that luggage. My luggage room is under the basement stairs. And here is Alfred's room. Oh, look at this. Alfred gets a sink right in his room. Built-in bookcase, little balconies. Very interesting room. Now we're heading up to the attic. This is where all the spooky things happen. Obviously the fans are not period. But there's a lot of storage space up here. Hmm. Oh, you look at this. This has an iron structure. Wow, who would have thought? All of this is iron construction. That's really neat. So all of these rolls are rugs and runners that were used in the house. Man, this is like the warehouse at the end of Indiana Jones. Just goes back further and further and further. And I would guess that the family didn't have the items tagged. That's probably what they're doing now in order to keep track of where everything was. But you never know. They could have done something like that by the servants too, right? Lots of stuff. Look at that spinning wheel. And there's even some of the wood molding up there. And you can see the back side of the slate roof. Wow. So we are back down on the main floor. It says there's a sewing room over here. Let's take a look at that. So here is the sewing room. I saw some of those sewing forms in the storage area earlier. I didn't point it out, but I saw it. And I wonder what this is, if that is a remnant from underneath that was painted over. That's what I'm guessing. Certainly not going to touch it. Okay, and here is a servant's dining room. Once again, this doesn't look bad. Not a bad way to eat, is it? Beautiful tables and chairs and a nice bench. And it looks out onto the woods. There's a road back there now. I don't know if there was a road back there 110 years ago. Built-in china cabinet. Very nice. And this obviously is a kitchen. Big, big kitchen. Wow. Really big kitchen. Nice big sinks. Here are some items that would have been used at the time. Cookie cutters and pastry bags and all kinds of things. I've never seen a flower frog before. 
set in a flower vase and used to keep flowers in an arrangement in place. Huh. Coffee grinder. I wonder if that's really a dinner bell they used. Well, they had a nice view from the kitchen too, didn't they? Once again, they have the intercom system. And I do not know what this is, but it has all of the different people's rooms and some kind of a gauge with the different bathrooms. I wonder what that's all about. I think I might have an idea. Next to each of those tubs was a button and that was to summon when you needed assistance. And I'll bet when you rang that button, this bell went off and the dial went over to tell which button was being rung. I'll bet that's what that is. And right now, someone did it in the living room. And this is the butler's pantry, it says. So once again, I bet this is for, you know, washing glasses and things of that type when you're serving. I don't know. I'm not an elegant type person. I'm only guessing. Oh, isn't this lovely? They have a breakfast room. And you can see both the garden and the lake. Wow, look at that. You see stuff like this in the movies. It's hard to believe people actually live this way. I don't know what this fountain is all about, but I'm guessing it's just purely decorative to give some ambiance. I wonder if in the summer months these windows could be open and be screened off so they can kind of feel like they're outdoors. And then this door goes to this huge balcony and then you have stairs down to the gardens and the outside. And we'll be out there looking at that a little later. Each of these tiles costs from five to seven dollars each which would be $125 to $150 in today's money. Every one had its own serial number, so it could be exactly replaced. In case there were to crack like these three, they're called Rookwood Pottery Tile. And this, of course, is the main dining room. Wow, this looks like something from the White House. Speaking of presidential, I've been to Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home. Nothing compared to this. And of course, the formal dining room also looks out on the lake. I can't move these curtains because they ask us not to touch things. But I'm sure you can see the view. And this rug is a replica of the original. Furniture, however, is original, so no sitting. I have a feeling when I go through this door, we might be heading to the billiard room. Oh no, this is the entryway. billiard room. If we were at Disney, he'd be talking right now. I'm quite sure I don't understand this billiards table since it doesn't have any pockets. But I'll bet someone that's watching this could explain the game that they played that didn't require pockets. And they had covers for the billiard table so it could double as a buffet table. And over here, you can see that cabinet for the cue sticks and the balls and you got to keep score right and the detail is amazing don't you think it's amazing I do and I imagine this is where the gentleman would sit maybe have a cigar 
and a brandy and discuss politics of the day. And that area out there is now a gift shop. But I don't imagine that it was when they lived here. And music, by the way, seems to be coming from the piano, but it's not. They cheated us. There's speakers down there. And this is the game room. Don't expect me to tell you exactly what the game room is. I just asked the question and I got a great answer. And it goes back to this billiard table. Remember they said they put a cover on it for dining. That was casual dining, particularly on the night that the cook had off. And they would set up the buffet in here. And then it said they would have rugs on the floor and they would eat in here. Very casual. And here it says they would sit picnic style on bearskin rugs. And sometimes they would heat up the food and cook the food in here. Look at that. Look at that. They would put pots and kettles and things over a real fire. And speaking of which, the fireplaces, although functional, were not what was the sole source of heat. You realize in all those rooms there were radiators and the radiators were the real heat. I guess we're gonna be seeing a boiler room very shortly. And every one of the 15 fireplaces was a different size, so they had to cut 15 different size cords of wood. There's also venting, which would either be for heating or for air return to a furnace. So lots of ways to stay warm in this house. And this is where they would sit picnic style on the bare skin rugs. And here's the back of the fireplace. Beautiful room. Okay, I'm gonna count these as shot glasses. So it passes the mark test. And look at this downspout. Right into this winter garden, which is what this was. It was an area in which they could just enjoy themselves and not have to be outside. But this room is huge. It runs the whole length of the house. And this appears to just be a hallway. This is where we just came down. All this space just for hallway. And this must be the boiler room. Holy cow. Look at all those gauges and pipes. And you can see most of them are disconnected now. Took a lot to heat a building this size. I asked upstairs if the plumbing worked. I was particularly interested in those fancy showers. She didn't know, but I'm recognizing one thing here. One little water heater. Looks kind of lonely down here next to all those pipes, doesn't it? You'd have to be an engineer just to know how to keep heat and water going to the radiators. I don't know why, but these intercoms just fascinate me. This is the best shape out of all of them I've seen so far. It says they used 150 tons of coal every winter to heat the place. I told you about the wood. This is a wood room, but right now it's an office for the tour guides. And this must be kind of a back entrance for the servants. But what I asked about upstairs that didn't exist, they do have here. And that is these brass rods that hold the carpets in place. And you usually see that in these older homes. They didn't have them upstairs, but they have them here. This is the milk room. I don't know if you can see it, but this floor is raised. It's kind of like a hump in the middle. And it all heads over that corner drain. So, since there's a lot of liquids in here, they plan for that. And all the milk came from property, from the stables. And I was correct in my guess, this goes directly up to the kitchen. So it makes a lot of sense, having the milk room here with easy access to the kitchen. And it looks like 
we've come to the end of the tour with our laundry room. Well, you look at that. I don't understand it, but it's some kind of a drying rack. I've never seen anything like this. And they have this giant iron from the American Ironing Machine Company of Chicago. Laundry was done on Monday, ironing was done on Tuesday. So get your stuff in on Sunday night. So I was right, those are drying racks. So things can be dried flat. That's what they look like on the inside. Not an unpleasant view when you're doing laundry either, is it? So mask off, hat on, as we head into the cold, and it's cold, it's in the 30s today, and we're gonna take a look at the grounds. And I don't know if I'm gonna have a lot of information for you about that. This is a servant's entrance. This is where we just left. This goes into the laundry room. And it looks like they had access to a nice little area here. Didn't seem like a bad place to work. So that is called the servant's courtyard. Very nice. And over there is the winter garden. That's where the gift shop was. So we're going to now check out that garden. If you remember when we were upstairs, when we were looking at the formal dining room, that was up there. That was the breakfast room right there. And you could come down these stairs. I guess I can go back up the stairs. Let's do it. If there's not a sign telling me no, I'm gonna try everything. Wow, you feel like the king of the world standing on this balcony. I'm sure those gardens are magnificent during the summer. We're here at the end of October. Look at that view. I almost said a million dollar view, but it's a lot more than that, isn't it? So there is the breakfast room. We were in there. That's where they had the green tile. They have the dining room in here. And we walk to that door. Oh, this is beautiful. There's a river. And look at that footbridge. I see there are some lights dangling from it. I'm curious what this looks like at nighttime. The grounds tours are pretty much self-guided. Here's a nice stone covered area where you can relax and gaze out over Lake Superior. There's the boathouse over there. And of course, there's the lake. And here is their beach. It's not what you think of as a beach really, is it? All rocky, but quite pleasant. And that's where the water is. That goes underneath that footbridge. The place just goes on and on and on. The mansion itself is just the start. These grounds are unbelievable. Here is that stone footbridge. The water's kind of stagnant. But you saw it flowing there. Right about there, it starts to really flow. So this water is moving, it just doesn't look like it. And there's a, another view of the mansion. That was amazing, that fox walked right up to me. And I must be blocking his way. And he's down by the water. Poor guy. I always get a little concerned when wild animals come too close to you, but I think we just startled each other. He was walking along this wall, and I think I looked at him and he looked at me. We we're about four to six feet away from each other. 
he kind of hissed and turned away. He didn't run away. He walked, then he turned back and looked at me again. And finally, he just walked down to the water. It was uh, pretty neat to see, but just a little scary because you don't want to get bit by a wild animal. Now, I don't know where he went. I assume he crossed the water down there. I was standing on the dock, looking back. That's where we started. That's the stable. And I wonder what that structure is that looks like a shark or a whale. Let's go take a look at it. It's getting really cold. I can barely hold my camera. My fingers are just frigid. I wonder if that's why they have Tim the Fox on here. I'm gonna have to ask. Clark was born into the world in February of 2020. Clark sits on the shore as a reminder of our duty as Lake Superiorians to keep these waters shark free. It should be noted, the shark is not an original part of the estate. So I wonder who built it. And this is the vegetable garden. It's tiered like it would be a beautiful flower garden. Chester Congdon envisioned Glen Sheen to be completely self-sufficient. So they had their own milking cows. They have their own garden that produced vegetables year-round. Well, obviously we're in Duluth. They couldn't grow year-round, but they preserved them and canned them so they could feed themselves, the family, and the staff from this garden. It's a huge, massive garden. No wonder the gardener had such a great place to live. And the garden is off to one side of the mansion. And now that I look, I can see that there's a direct path that goes to the uh, courtyard that the servants used. And we looked out of that courtyard from the other side, remember? We're going around in circles now. So crossing this footbridge is another stream. And it goes way over there. So if you remember, straight ahead, those windows on the bottom lead to the laundry. And this is the servant's courtyard that they only had access to. The family didn't come back here. All of this side of the mansion, up at the top, that's the attic. And I think the second set of windows down from the top is the servant's quarters. That's a lot of house. I'd have to go back and look at the video to be sure. But I think most of this side of the house were servants' quarters and work areas. Before we go, I want to check the map and see if I missed anything. I don't think so. We saw the carriage house, we saw the gardener's cottage, the garden. We saw just about everything. Chester Cogden, Iron Magnet, had a dream. And boy, did he realize it. What a magnificent home. Apparently his family was very successful too. And quite uh, the benefactors of the community. They gave this home to the college and they operate it now. Just a, a fascinating place. Thanks for joining me on this tour of Glensheen Manor in Duluth, Minnesota. As always, I encourage you to like and share the videos. Leave your comments down below. If you haven't already, please subscribe by clicking my face in the corner. And don't forget to ring that bell icon. That way you'll know when I post new videos. From Duluth, Minnesota, I'm Mark, and this is The Average Me Channel.